Sign up for WinBet Sportsbook at wynnbet.com today using promo code BLUEWIRE to get up to $1,000 toward a risk-free sports bet. Offer subject to change, terms, and conditions at winbet.com. Must be 21 or older and present in the state where play-through WinBet is available. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem, call 1-800-522-4700. What is crack in Hardwood Knox listeners? I am Dan Valley coming at you without my fantabulous co-host, Adam Frommel. I told you all we were going to be going seven days a week until the start of the season. And if you are listening to this podcast on the day it's coming out, which is a Saturday, September 25th, that's probably proof that I'm not lying since we very rarely publish podcasts on the weekend. We have Caitlin Cooper from Indy Cornrows on today to help school us on everything Pacers leading into the 21-22 NBA season. Follow her on Twitter at C2 underscore Cooper. She also has a piece up right now on, on 538 on Eric Gordon, the value of spacing, how defenses react to where guys are standing, and how spacing is more than just about raw shooting percentages. It's a fantastic piece, like everything she writes, so, so go check that out. Before we dive headfirst, or maybe I belly flopped into this Pacer discussion, who really knows? Just going to unload some feels here very quickly because this is a milestone podcast for Hardwood Knox. It is our 500th full-length episode. We have some trailers, I think like three or four of them, sprinkled throughout our feed. This is the 500th full-length episode. We've been around more than half a decade. We weren't always a a multi-episode podcast per week. It was sometimes one a week. When we really started this thing at the beginning, five or six or seven years ago, We I don't even know if we were publishing once a week. So that number is significant to me just how long this podcast has been around. I have been pretty open. Adam's been pretty open. This is not the biggest league-wide podcast around, not even close, but we do have an audience and we appreciate every single one of you. And it's it's a loyal audience. We might not have the most Twitter engagements. You're fantastic with the mailbags, by the way, in my DMs, in the mentions, when I send out the solicitation tweets, that's not a complaint. I think it's just, the reality is, is sometimes it can be hard to, one, we're probably not the the most active on social media to begin with, but it can be harder to engage a community where you're not covering one specific market or team and have that built in goodwill there. We still do have a community here and you guys, not only did you show up through the pandemic or at the peak of the pandemic, I don't even know how to, how to phrase, but when things were shut down, when the league was shut down downloads across the board for pretty much every podcast, like they were hurting, um, including ours, but it was not down by that much relative to where we were at the time. And so you guys have always showed up. You show up for the single team look aheads where we're going to go. If we're talking an hour about the, the Indiana Pacers, or if I go in 90 minutes on the Charlotte Hornets, spoiler alert, maybe for the, the next podcast that comes out Um, the downloads are there. You guys are listening. You're engaging. I am forever super appreciative of it. We did have something special. I say planned for you. For the 500th episode, but it was really more of a vanity project at that point because it was something that I would have always wanted to do. It's, Adam and I never, uh, last minute scheduling conflict, basically. We're supposed to have it ready and just didn't. I won't tease it any more than this because we might still go to it in the future. Uh, and I did tease it at one point on Twitter a couple weeks ago, so you might have even seen it. So um, that's as much as I'll, I'll give away about it. Um, doing this podcast with Caitlin though, and I did not tell her she was going to be on the, the 500th episode, and this is not supposed to be some sort of a big event, uh, but she was one of the first when, when we actively decided that we need to bring on guests, she was one of our original guests that came on was kind enough to give us so much of her time. And she has over the years, and she's always been great, uh, but she's really blown up over the past few years. And uh, if you're not following her on Twitter again, at C2 underscore Cooper, I don't know what the hell you're doing with your life. But she has blown up, and yet she's still nice enough to come on this podcast, this rinky-dink, independent, you know, sub-mediocre NBA podcast and talk basketball with us two, three times a year. Uh, we've only had one other guest on more often than her at this point. She actually just broke a tie with Tara Bowen Biggs, uh, who covers the Blazers, host of the uh, What podcast. Uh, we have a take podcast. Excuse me. That's great. Check that out. She'll be coming on soon, too. Um, but Caitlin, they, they're like, every time they come on, they sort of tie each other, but Caitlin's now moved ahead of her. That's not really a title to be proud of, I guess, to come on this podcast so often, but my point being, and it's not to and I, again, I didn't tell Caitlin, this is the 500th episode that she was coming on for. I actually told her that I was moving up when I was publishing this episode. It's not supposed to be special, but I'm just thankful for her and every single other guest that gives us so much of their time and, and keeps coming back. Um, I say, if I ask you once, if I ask you twice, like that's fair. Maybe I've hood wink you into coming on. But if you're coming back three plus, four plus, five plus times, at that point, it's a decision. And I appreciate all of our guests. I appreciate all of our listeners. We will continue to try and grow. Uh, that's a good segue to say, hey, subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast, download every episode, 
We're on YouTube as well. Once we get to 1K subscribers, we will start doing YouTube live sessions, more YouTube exclusives than we've done. And we have done some exclusives for anyone who's not subscribed to us there. YouTube.com, search Hardwood Knox will come up. Follow us on Twitter, at Hardwood Knox. But just wanted to take a moment to, to thank everyone, from guests to listeners who have rocked with us through the years, who are continue rocking with us. Uh, this is a lot of fun. And like I said, we may not be the, the biggest league-wide podcast, uh, but we do we do enjoy doing this. We do enjoy interacting with you guys. And hey, if this is your first time listening to us because you saw that Caitlin Cooper, the famous Caitlin Cooper was on this podcast, consider giving us a permanent subscription, downloading our episodes, checking us out just beyond this episode, rating, reviewing us wherever you're getting your podcast. That helps a ton. Here's to I'm gonna, 500 more episodes, I guess. I don't really even know if, if, if I want to be around that long. I don't know if you guys want us to be around that long. But that's enough. Me waxing poetic about these last seven years or whatever it's been. It, it has indeed, though, been a bas- blast, continues to be a blast. But let's go into a deep dive on the 21-22 Indiana Pacers with none other than Indy Corn Roses, Caitlin Cooper. Caitlin, thank you so much for coming back on Hardwood Knox. I don't know. Do we call you like mainstream Caitlin Cooper now that you've been published at 538 in addition to Indy Corn Rose? Um, whatever we're supposed to call you, you're fantastic, and we appreciate you coming back to talk, as always, about the Indiana Pacers, who, rumor has it, will not be making a head coaching firing or change while we are recording this podcast, which should be great. First and foremost, though, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Like I, I appreciate, like, I'm a, assuming that you contacted Kevin Pritchard before we did this and just said, hey, we got a podcast going on, and we'd really appreciate it if you didn't make any major changes during this this one hour session. You know, I did, but he was he was too busy retweeting crypto propaganda onto my <laughs> timeline to uh, to give me an answer. Apparently, so let's cross our fingers that uh, nothing wild happens on this podcast. Um, I guess I just sort of want to start here. Is I know you the biggest off season addition or move that they made was just hiring Rick Carlisle, and we kind of got into this during the live. It was a I don't know what the podcast was called, but Rick Carl or Rick Carl wasn't hired while we were recording, but Nate Bjorken was fired. And we talked loosely about maybe the Pacers would go after Rick Carlisle. I know you've now written elements about what he'll bring to the Pacers offense. Um, but what is, is there anything specific that you think we can expect to see from this team, whether it's just a particular way that their offense is going to be run or maybe a particular player that will be used differently? Yeah. I mean, several things. I think if you look back, like just over the last two years, Nate McMillan, the Pacers were kind of good at being vanilla. Like the actions were very, you know, one and done. It was somewhat hitchy and they needed to get more movement. So Nate Bjorkman did that to his credit. I mean, they were close to the top of the league in motion. They had people moving on the weak side, but it became pretty mechanical and predictable and somewhat of what they were doing. Like, I think there was other options they could have hit, but it very much felt like a micromanaged offense. So I think now with Rick Carlisle, maybe you get a little bit of both blended in and you get an upgrade in that way. And that he has some very nuanced and good play calls that I think will fit various other players. But at the same time, I think that's what people assume of him, but he also did a good job. I mean, in some of it's Luca, like having the benefit of everything that Luca brings, but uh, using very simple actions at the beginning of a play to really empower playmakers and to create small edges. I mean, I wrote a piece that people can go and look at about structure while Malcolm Brogdon kind of hit on this the like teams that are have too much structure or robotic and teams that don't have enough are too up and down and the Pacers were kind of both sides of that coin last year so I think like you know just in their Spain actions they they would always go and the, the ball handler would be coming off the left side and when you watch the Mavericks they, they a lot of times those screens are flat so like a ball handler is going to have more options to go off either way. And then the back screener can leak out either way. So that just creates a little bit more randomness. But I think from an individual player standpoint, uh, I would like to see, and I wrote about this with Miles Turner a year ago, that just, you know, the fake it till you make it thing from three. So like he shot more threes last year, but if you're making yourself a legitimate threat, even if you're not hitting those at a super high clip, I think that that would draw a little bit more attention to him. And I actually use Porzingis as an example because the Mavericks were using him as a trailer and transition. And I think there's a psychology to that. So I think that miles is kind of one of the last starters that kind of has probably maybe some untapped potential there that hasn't really been delved out if he can, you know, and I do think some of this is just on him. Like at a certain point in time, you just have to make shots. Like only 27% of his threes were contested last year. So at a certain point in time, you just have to hit those. But um, 
I think you'll still see Sabonis being empowered as a playmaker. I think you'll see team ball from the guard positions with both Brogdon and, and Levert being able to play off of each other and downhill. So that's kind of a, a glossy overlook, I guess we should say. There's and I part of this is obviously because the Mavericks had Luca and he's such a heliocentric player. But the Mavs were Indiana, first of all, was fourth in average possession time after Karis Levert made his debut last year. That was per unpredictable. The Mavericks during that same span were 25th. Do you expect that Carlisle is going to slow things down with his team or maybe take away from their transition volume? Does that question not even matter because it's not like the Pacers were this world beating offense anyway? So making those types of I don't want to, maybe not wholesale shifts, but shifts aren't that big of a deal. Right. And this is going to sound contrary to the entire Nate McMillan tenure, because there was a lot of pressure of like, this team needs to play faster. And in part they did because of what their shot profile was when you're leaning on mid range shots, that's pretty boom or bust. And, and they just needed to get more possessions in order to stay ahead. Like they didn't have a very nuanced offense. Now, Nate Bjorkren did that. Like you just mentioned, they really dialed it up, but I don't think that that was completely to their advantage. In part, I think he dialed up the pace because they had to outrun their own defense, but in so doing it impacted and made their defense worse. Like when you're taking, very quick shots that's that's your first line of transition defense honestly if you're taking a quick kamikaze layup that doesn't really have much of a chance and you're just attacking for the sake of playing fast that can lead to fast break scores at the other end and then it, it just was creating like a vicious cycle between where they were getting advantages from so i don't think it's going to be a bad thing if the overall offense is functioning at a better level if they're not playing you know as slapdash as what it was over the last two months of the bjorkren era there's so, so Doug McDermott left and I'm just curious as to, and I guess this question is more loaded until we know for sure when TJ Warren is going to come back, but how big of a loss do you think he ends up being for this team? Right. I think I touched on this one. This was like maybe one of my only good moments from the last time I was on here <laughs> that, <laughs> that um, just how well he and Sabonis fit together. I mean, that was the number one assist combo on the Pacers. And some of that was due to availability, but they also like McDermott loves to move from left to right as a shooter. That's where most of his percentage of his shots off screens are coming from. And, and Sabonis loves to work his left hand and dribble handoff. So, and just like, you can say, and I believe this, like Sabonis can develop chemistry with anyone. He's a good enough playmaker, but not everyone is going to do what Doug McDermott does. Not everyone's going to be willing to make those reads and make those cuts and be able to set up his man on a screen to cut back door, work top blocking in various coverages. So um, I can't say that Sabonis had the same chemistry with Justin Holiday that he had with Doug McDermott and they're both movement shooters. So it is somewhat of a loaded question. Like I'll have to see what this Chris Duarte bring in this kind of similar role. I mean, he's going to be kind of their main movement shooter that they have left along with Justin. So if he can offer some of that, maybe it mitigates it. But like, as you say, like if it was a question just between, which I mean, it wasn't because McDermott got offered more money, but like money aside, if you're just looking at TJ and Doug, like I think TJ is going to give you more in the regular season and keep the offense moving. And he certainly has value. I mean, there's games you can point to from last year that they probably would not have won without TJ McConnell, but in terms of what both of them will offer you in the postseason and what that established role already was in two man game with Sabonis, I do think McDermott's going to be an underrated loss unless Chris Duarte immediately pops. Yeah, and like the contracts were so different that it clear, maybe it wasn't an either or choice, but right. I would personally prefer McDermott on this team. Does that so? Do you think then, since you mentioned him, that buzzer beater, summer league buzzer beater King Chris Duarte is going to get a chance to play during his rookie year at this team? Yeah, it's interesting. Rick Carlisle's really talked up both rookies already. I mean, he's he's said a lot about Chris Duarte and Isaiah Jackson, and they both were impressive in summer league. I don't know that I'm ready to make that leap after four summer league games, but. Uh, I think I would be somewhat disappointed if Chris Duarte isn't in the rotation somewhere. I mean, they took him number 13 and, and I think he fits for this offense for the reasons I just said, like in Rick Carlisle's scheme, like the, the, the people are rarely just standing. They're going to be using a lot of flare screens in different ways. There's going to be guard to guard screens. There's going to be a lot of Spain where you're going to need that back screener. who can actually put tension flaring out. He's the best fit for that, to, in my opinion, on this roster. So I think that he needs to at least have a bench role when the season starts. That's my opinion. But Do we need to infer anything about their faith or lack thereof in Goga after they, have, after they got Isaiah Jackson in the draft? Man, it just feels like Goga stock is at an all-time low. Like, yeah. Because, I mean... It, it, they also mentioned at the end or when Rick Carlisle was introduced, like the possibility of staggering Miles and Sabonis more. If you're staggering them more, there's already going to be fewer minutes at center. 
And you're not going to play Goga at the four. At least I don't think so. They've talked about using Isaiah Jackson at the four, potentially, which I'm interested to see how that pans out. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know exactly how Goga is going to fit in other than the role he's already had, which is, you know, if one of the big gets bigs get hurt, maybe he gets to play or maybe he gets five minutes over the end of the first quarter and the second quarter. And if the game's going well, he might get that same stint in the third. But I think it's going to be pretty hard for him to carve out a role unless they suddenly surprise us during this podcast and, and trade Miles Turner or DeMontis Sabonis and then, you know. If you noticed, there was no direct Sabonis Turner question in the outline I sent you. I'm giving us a respite. This is like the third or fourth year we're doing this, and it feels like it would be the third or fourth year of just asking that same question. (laughs) No, I appreciate that. You Um, get me. Yeah. So the other kind of, I guess the most notable other thing they did was adding Tory Craig, who feels like a no-brainer fit just defensively, and kind of his run with the Suns was very interesting. But you wrote about this. His offensive fit is going to probably be dependent on him doing different things, or at least as you put it, I think it was getting out of the way at points. So what do you, what do you think they need to see from him on offense? What, what type of role do you expect him to play with this team? Right. And I think that like the best way I could describe it. And the first time I noticed this, I really wasn't thinking about Torrey Craig in relation with the Pacers. It was when the Nuggets played the Lakers in the Western conference finals in the bubble and they were posting Jokic against switches. And it just felt like his rhythm was somewhat other from the rest of the nuggets in terms of when he was supposed to cut and when he wasn't and when he should have been pulling over to create space. So I liken him somewhat to what Thaddeus young was for the Pacers a few years ago. And that like everyone always talked about that as this malleable defender and having the heft to defend the post, but also the mobility on the perimeter. And that was true, but he was also good at filling the gaps in terms of manufacturing angles as like a secondary option along the baseline. Like he was really good at finding passing lanes out of the dunker spot and Torrey Craig and the Milwaukee offense was being used because you know Bud was using the dunker spot a little bit more and it didn't really feel like Torrey quite worked that out like I talked to a few people that cover the Bucks and was like you know why wasn't he really getting minutes there like why didn't he take off and and the overall response that I got a few people told me he was somewhat mopey and that like Bud wanted to play him more but then like Thanasis's all-out effort was just like superseding his so that's somewhat concerning. I mean, obviously he played a pretty good role in the Western conference finals for the Suns against Paul George had some really nice possessions, but I do think offensively, and this is part of the thing with having Torrey Craig. And they've mentioned now that like Torrey Craig was signed in part because they had doubts that TJ Warren was going to be available, but um, that they're better equipped to weather that injury. But at the same time, a lot of these guys, while they do provide elements of what TJ Warren brings, they don't provide everything that TJ Warren brings all at once. So yeah, you're gaining Torrey Craig's defense and the potential that he could like help an all switch lineup, but he's not going to provide the same scoring punch. I mean, it was kind of funny when you watch that, uh, the finals at how much Milwaukee just didn't care about him as a shooter. It's like, Oh yeah, we know that you played for us and, and we're not going to, we're not going to be too concerned about that. Yeah. And he was hitting threes right. for most of his time in Phoenix and just teams, even there, they just didn't care. Like they just yeah. weren't, weren't on him. Maybe he'll be happier in Indy because I'm assuming free agency last year didn't plan out, pan out as he expected. He ended up on a minimum deal and the Nuggets didn't even want him back. So perhaps now that he's on like a, you know, two year, $10 million deal, he can, I'd be pretty happy about that. But TJ Warren, his name has come up like half a dozen times already. Uh, everything with him seems very undefined about that return from other than the fact that he's not ready after suffering the, um, the stress fracture in his left foot, any sense of when, they should hope for him to be ready. And then just how looking at the long-term outlook, at least through this season for the Pacers, how important is he to optimizing the best version that this team can actually be? Right. I mean, I think it's, I think that the injury update being released three weeks before training camp even starts is somewhat ominous on itself that they were like willing to get that far out in front of it. And I know that they've had a few quotes where they're like, you know, he's, he's doing rehab. We don't know what that means in the short term, it sounds like they're confident that he's going to be back and that he's going to be okay, but they don't have any idea when that's going to be. I personally will be surprised like if he's ready when the season starts, because if he isn't even going to be producing and, and training camp. So, and, and what I just mentioned that they said that they signed Torrey Craig in anticipation that TJ might be out. That leads me to think that they're expecting that he's going to be missing regular season games, but I don't know that for fact, but um, yeah, I mean, 
they have Tory Craig that can guard wings, which was not an option that they had last year. They were like all combo guards and centers, and then they were giving up season highs to OG Ananobi and Bridges and Harrison Barnes and a whole string of other wings, not to mention just like, you know, having no one that can even try to catch the first step of somebody like Giannis and try to handle that type of a matchup. Um, they also have Justin who can play some four and play the three. They have Keelan Martin. If I, if I, if they feel good about Isaiah Jackson, he can play some four and, and they can downsize a little bit there. So like they have all these different guys they can throw out there, but each thing that you get with one of them, you're losing one of TJ Warren's skills. So for me, like the fact that he's the full package deal and can be, you know, a play finisher, obviously as a bucket getter, you know, insert smoke coming out of nose emoji, and then uh, can also be a two-way player that was, I mean, Justin Holiday mentioned this in exit interviews and I agree with him. Like TJ Warren was probably their best on-ball defender the prior season under McMillan and they just didn't have him. So I think he's pretty critical for their uh, potential playoff success if they're going to get back in there and, and potentially be, you know, competing in the first round. The way he defended, or at least the types of assignments he was covering in the prior year, in the, the bubble year, whatever you want to call it, you could probably make the case based on how the team is built now that he might just be more important to them functioning on defense than he is on right. offense. Cause just the covers that he like the individual assignments he has were just essentially the other team's best player on the wings or best player period. Well, yeah. Cause I mean, you look at it, I mean, even in the bubble and throughout last season, there was times where he was guarding Devin Booker or Jamal Murray, and then he's in the bubble and he's guarding Anthony Davis. So exactly what you're saying. It, who slides into what would be the uh, TJ Warren spot in the starting lineup? Is it Craig? Is it Holiday? Is it someone else? And like McDermott's not there as an option anymore, obviously. Yeah, my thought is because of the way that they use so many guard to guard screens and the flare screens, like I mentioned before, it feels like it's going to have to be Justin. Or if Chris Duarte is just really impressing you in training camp, it feels like it's going to have to be one of the two of them. I kind of think Tori fits more ideally as like a small ball four when he comes in with one of the centers in a bench lineup, but I, I almost am not completely opposed to like a flex lineup that if you play a team like the Clippers and you really need a wing defender, maybe you start Torrey Craig and maybe the rest of the time you're looking at a movement shooter to pair with Sabonis and the starters and make use of some of those other things on offense that, that seems like that are going to be important. No team can afford to overpay for talent. Build a championship team with Indeed, the smart way to only pay for quality candidates that meet your must-have requirements. When hiring gets hard, you need Indeed, the job site that makes hiring incredibly simple. Just attract, interview, and hire. In fact, with Indeed, you can do all of your hiring in just one place. Indeed knows how important it is to make the most of your recruiting hours and dollars. And with Indeed, you can save time and money by setting your must-have qualifications and only pay for the quality candidates that meet them. Get started right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Get a $75 credit at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Offer valid through September 30th. Terms and conditions apply. Hey guys, looking for a betting advantage this football season? You need to download BetQL, the only app you'll need to compare betting odds and make smart bets. Their best bet computer model scans over 350,000 unique bets per year to give you a best bet recommendation for every game across all major sports and gives you the reasoning behind why you should place the bet. Their model covers everything from spreads, over-unders, and player prop bets. Don't want to use this model and prefer to do the research yourself? Well, BetQL has all the necessary tools for your betting research needs. Tools like line movement and sharp data on who the pros are backing, team summaries highlighting previous success against the spread and over-under, team lineup breaking news and injury status updates, and leaderboards to track how you stack up against others and to view your winning streaks. Better data, better bets. Head to the App Store or Google Play Store now to download BetQL. You can also head to try.betql.co slash BlueWire to get started now. Enter the discount code BlueWire at payment checkout for 25% off any of their subscription offerings. Make sure to check out their offers page to find a special offer to receive a full free year of BetQL. Don't miss out on the chance to gain your betting advantage during this football season. What's interesting about this team compared to Carlisle's past three iterations of the Mavericks, they just had a very clear pecking order with Luka Doncic, and it was just all Luka Doncic. But on this team, right now, healthy, you have Karis LeVert, you have Malcolm Brogdon, you have um, Sabonis. 
who do you think is, or who will be, because I'm sure you know this, to be like the primary offensive vessel through which most of the offense is run on this team? Right. So, I mean, one of the buzzwords that I think I've heard like a million times this summer is unselfish basketball. So I think it's going to be somewhat more egalitarian than it was a year ago. But if you look at the numbers when Karis and Brogdon and Sabonis were on the floor, which that is a pretty small sample size, it's like 400 minutes. But Karis's usage was the highest of the three, then Brogdon, then Sabonis. I think there's somewhat of a misconception that because Sabonis has so many touches that he's like been their number one option or has been like the quote unquote that guy. And it's like, yeah, they're funneling touches through him because they needed to, I mean, for one, he's very good at running dribble handoffs. I don't really understand why any coach wouldn't take advantage of what he offers in that way. And I think that the uh, Rick Carlisle will continue to do that because the Mavericks ran a lot of delay up top as well. But also when only Karras or Brogdon was available, they hit, you had to provide some way for other guys to get downhill. So they're running like Chicago, which, you know, pinned down into a dribble handoff or Miami uh, handoff into a ball screen because you had to have an extra layer to help people be able to penetrate the defense. So they, they ran handoffs about more than about anybody last year in the league. They ran a ton of handoffs and that's in part why. So yeah, he's having a lot of touches or like it's a flip set and you might get like three touches on each play. They run that like eight times a game through various variations. Like his touches are going to rack up, but um, generally speaking, I still think a lot of stuff will be run Sabonis and through Sabonis in the way I just said, but I also think you'll see Karras and Brogdon, you know, opposite of each other at the top two slots and like uh, running flip sets between the two of them, but also like buddying up where you might see like a ball screen between Sabonis and Karras on one side of the floor. And then you throw a quick pass, fire it to the other side to, to Brogdon off a step up screen from Turner who that can then pop because those are things that feature pretty heavily for the Mavericks last year. You'd see that between Luca and Jalen Brunson with the ball typically getting fired to, to Luca. So I think that there's a way for all three of them to be doing that. I mean, in general, just as like a side podcast rant, like I see stuff all the time. <laughs> I mean, and this parlays into it for some of the reasons I just said, because, you know, I even saw this morning, like, well, Sabonis can't be that guy for the Pacers. Well, my response to that is why does he need to be like, wh- why? Like, I don't really right. understand why that's even a conversation. Like, yeah, he's a two-time all-star, but he's only making $18 million. Like I'm not really concerned with somebody who's a play mover and connector who can elevate and keep offenses moving, making $18 million a year. And then having an argument about why, like, well, he can't be a number one or scoring option or franchise guy. Plus he continues to get better every year. So I don't, I don't know. Some of the narratives with Sabonis and the Pacers, I find incredibly weird, but that's just my perspective. Yeah. It does seem like a lot of the national perception of him is he's like, that he plays a lot slower like that everyone just views him as a throwback player and I don't know that I've ever viewed him in that regard and it just feels like if you watch the Pacers especially over the last two years I don't know why you look at Sabonis and think he's just super throwback is it because he's a big who is such like a an important cog in the offensive mission like I I don't necessarily understand that perception a ton anyway Well, yeah, because I mean, I think some of it comes and I do think that this would benefit to be altered somewhat. And I think that it will be, I mean, his post-up percentage was much higher last year because for some of the reasons I said, there's only one downhill option on the floor for much of the year. Teams were ducking under pretty heavily against Brogdon and Karras when only one of them was on the floor. So that took some of what he can do in the short roll away. So then it's like, okay, we're going to dump it down to him in the post and, and hope he can score, which if he has a more physical matchup and teams aren't switching, you needed to be running some split cuts of some sort. And they only had like three various plays that they ran and they ran them the same way every time. So I think that you'll see more randomness with the split action between Karras and Brogdon up above and moving Sabonis into the high post and the elbow area even more. But yeah, I mean, he runs delay up top. They run five out with him. Like he's a great off ball screener. He can be setting flare screens, flare screen, ball screen is very hard for teams to defend, not only because it's, it's two actions, but if you sag off of him as a non-shooter, then you're giving up a pull up three on the ball screen. So I think there's potential for stuff that they can do there, but I think just because, you know, He's not necessarily shooting threes. People just exactly what you said. They think he's like anti-modern or something. And and they were playing at a fast pace with him at the end of the year too. So I don't even really see that argument, but some of it is very weird. Uh, 
Karis Levert, I think this got lost a lot in Brooklyn because of his own injuries, because of just the turnover with the rosters, because he was never necessarily the primary guy. There was the shift to D'Lo in part because of the Karis Levert injury, and then you have all those stars coming through. But he gives you a lot from the point of attack on offense, more than even just as a score. I've always thought his passing is underrated. That being said, each of the past three years, he has shot a higher percentage on his off-the-dribble threes than catch-and-shoot threes. And that's not the only barometer for can he work better off the ball. But I'm just, I've looked at that and I look at how he plays. And I'm just wondering, do you see a path or anything you saw from him last season hinted at his ability to maybe play better offensively off others who have the ball in their hands? Right. I mean, that's, that's the real interesting point about him. Cause I think for his career, he's like 33% on catch and shoot threes. Like it, it's very weird that somebody would be shooting better on the harder attempts, but it seems like he's not always shot ready when he's off the ball. Like that's something that stuck out a lot when Duarte in particular was in summer league, that guy is always ready to be shooting. And it doesn't seem like Karis always is with his feet, but um, do I, I I can't prognosticate that I think he's suddenly going to start shooting the ball better in that way. I mean, I don't know, maybe Rick Carlisle and his coaching staff have like shot doctors working with him in that regard. It's possible, but I think what you say there is interesting and that like, do I think, He's suddenly going to be great off ball as a spot up shooter. No, as the back screener in Spain, probably not. But do I think he can be off ball ready to attack and like the boomerang action I explained earlier? Yeah. Or like if you're running delay and he's in the corner with Sabonis running the handoff into the pin down for him to attack in that way. Yes. Like we saw that that worked in ways last year. I do think that Brogdon will probably continue to be, somewhat of the primary. I mean, he's talked before he thinks his best position is point guard. And, and in some ways, I mean, what you said too, it makes sense because I do think Karras's passing is somewhat underrated. He typically hits kind of the same spots on the floor, but that stood out to me and his ability to read off ball screens to get him into position. Like he's not going to fly off of two Iverson, uh, like the Iverson cut or, or fly off of a stagger and suddenly hit a three, like he's Doug McDermott, but he does make reads of where guys are when they're trailing him, whether that's the cut back door or, or to get himself open and to get to the ball screen action in ways that I didn't really expect to see. So I think that there's more that they can explore with that, where it won't just be reliant completely on how well he's shooting a spot up three though you would like to see improvement i do want to see him setting back screens now in the spain pick and roll now that you mentioned it I'd, I'd, if i if he's done it already a bunch i guess i've missed it no i've already. never seen it <laughs> uh this one of the things that i always found funny in dallas with carlos he just regardless it seemed like who was on the second unit what the bench was the Mavs are always able to cobble together these second unit heavy lineups that were good um, how do you sort of see that rotation shaking out after the starting five for for Indy, whether it's how they're going to stagger Turner and Sabonis and who they're surrounding those guys with? Is there a player maybe even that people aren't talking about that's going to play a bigger role under Kyle Allen? Like could could uh, Brissett wind up playing a bigger role? Or Jeremy Lamb kind of seems like a Rick Carlisle type player a little bit, even though he's not necessarily an afterthought for this team. So I'm just curious how you see that element outside the starting five shaking out. The entire Jeremy Lamb perception is going to be kind of interesting, especially in the wake of TJ Warren's indefinite absence and Edmund Sumner rupturing his Achilles tendon, because heading into the season, there was rumblings that the Pacers had been looking to find a new home for Jeremy, which made sense because if everyone was healthy, he might be, you know, taking minutes from Duarte at kind of that backup two spot and Jeremy's going to be in a contract year. So would he necessarily be happy in that type of situation? But now that they're down by two wings and he's healthy, like there's still stuff that Jeremy can offer. He shot the three well last year. He can mosey into the lane and get to his spots. Like, and I agree with you, like the perception might've been that he'd be out of the rotation, but now if they need guys to kind of make up that scoring, it makes sense that he could be in the 10 man depending upon how it shakes out. It's kind of difficult for me to parse right now until I know completely who they're going to start in place of, of TJ. But um, the one lineup that worked really well for them two years ago with TJ and Aaron holiday and Justin and Doug and Sabonis, I'd like to find some sort of facsimile. I'd like to see them find some sort of facsimile for that. Cause I do think it would be so to both miles and Sabonis's benefit to go back to the arrangement where so bonus would play like the first six minutes of the first quarter and then come out with miles playing almost the entire first quarter with the starters and then bring Sabonis back in to play with the bench. 
Because I think Sabonis, with everything that he gets asked to do, with as physical as he gets asked to play, with having to defend fours at the other end and and uh, carrying the load in terms of playmaking and his amount of touches that get funneled through him, I think it's better for him to play in shorter bursts. I thought there was times at the end, especially the first and the third quarters last year, because he and Miles kind of flip-flopped roles under Bjorken where Miles would play more with the bench that Sabonis just didn't look like he had the same energy stores. Like even on the glass, it was like, it'd be at the end of the quarter and somebody might, you know, get two second chances that you wouldn't otherwise see with him out there. So then it becomes, you know, guaranteed TJ McConnell is going to be the backup point. I thought O'Shea Brissett might be able to sneak in there at the backup four spot, but now it's like, you know, is that Tory? Seems like that could be either way, depending upon how they view Jeremy Lamb. So it's hard for me to come up with a definitive five, I probably could have given you a better one if, if this roster would be healthy, but it seems like that's never going to happen. So is, do we expect Turner to be just full go to start the season after that right toe injury last year? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm so happy for him getting to see him on videos. Like I, I typically don't like uh, watching all of the off season workout clips. Like I've kind of had enough of that, but Given what that, about, what do you got? Furcon Mouse's hype tape. Oh, now that one I love. That <laughs> one I love. That one could stay. But um, given what he revealed about, you know, that he really struggled with that injury, both physically and mentally, it looked like from what he shared that he's been back, being able to play up and down some, and at least been able to put in work in his shot, which is another element of this because, you know, under Nate McMillan, he had kind of indicated on a podcast with CJ McCollum that uh, they weren't necessarily on the same page about what his role was going to be. And then last off season, uh, there just wasn't a lot of time in between the bubble and the start for him to really have worked, you know, on being a stretch four, so to speak. And now it feels like this, this summer, he should have had a pretty good indicator of what his role is going to be. I know Rick Carlisle met with him a couple of times or went and visited him and that he's had time. He's shown lots of videos of working on his shot. So maybe there'll be some development there. In addition to working out with Julius Randall, who we do know did improve his shot. So, you know, you never yeah, he, know. He shot the ball okay outside of that first round matchup with the Atlanta Hawks. Yes. Aside from that, we'll ignore that. But uh, this is going to be your favorite question, obviously, but it is part of the the cookie cutter questions I ask on every look ahead. We have to go through the season. I think you can understand more of this. But as of right now, if you had to pick, who's the player that's most likely to get traded before the deadline? Well, I mean, it wouldn't necessarily surprise me if the roster gets healthy and since Jeremy Lamb isn't an expiring year, if they wanted to eventually clear minutes, like maybe Jeremy plays can show a contender. Hey, I'm, I'm healthy. I can still contribute in a bench role for you if he got moved, but the, the entire TJ situation is somewhat interesting too, because he's an expiring contract. I doubt he reaches an agreement on an extension because he's not going to make as much of an extension as he will likely make in free agency, depending upon what his foot situation is. And then when does he return and what, like how confident are the Pacers that they're going to be able to re-sign him? I think that's kind of an underrated thing to watch with the Pacers is how they view that long-term relationship. Cause I don't think he's going to come up with an extension, but the double big thing is always going to loom. Like if they don't get off to a great start and it just doesn't seem like this team's ever going to be, you know, better than what they were at full strength. You got to look at moving one or the other of them, like at a certain point in time, especially just what I said before. Like if you're, if you're already thinking about how much you're going to have to stagger them. Yeah. And then there was even some rumblings uh, in the Indy star. It was reported that a league source had said they might bring miles off the bench. Like to me, if you're even considering bringing one of them off the bench and you're going to have to stagger them a bunch. And if they aren't closing games together, it's time to pull the plug. Like your best players need to be able to play together. So that's where I land with it. To me, it would just be bizarre to make that decision then in the middle of the season if they're thinking about it throughout the entire offseason. As you said, you mentioned, I didn't even see the bench stuff with Turner. So if you were thinking along those lines, or and I know it's a different coach, but like if if you're trying to like hell to figure out how you're going to stagger them and what that does to your closing rotations. I just don't know why there wouldn't be more due diligence. Like, why isn't that a to me? That seems like a move because of how important theoretically both those players are that you should be making over the off season rather than the middle of the year where I guess maybe it's easier to adjust, but then you're also just bringing in guys who didn't have a training camp with you, like aren't t- totally familiar with the team. And so that would be, especially if they did it early on, that would kind of right. blow my mind a little bit at this point. 
Right. And I don't know. I don't know that that was necessarily coming from the Pacers because it didn't say a Pacer source or a team source. It said a league source. So that might have been there's another team suggesting how the Pacers might make that pairing work. I don't know. Like a pop defender from Charlotte or something. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Maybe they'll bring Turner off the bench because <laughs> we would like Miles Turner to start for us. But um yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing. I think I talked about that when I was on here the last time, that if you were going to make a move for either one of them, especially with Sabonis, that you would want to know that in the summer because you would be structuring the defense entirely differently than what you would be doing with Miles. Like, you're not going to be funneling a bunch of stuff to Miles if that's going to be Sabonis at solo five and, you know, vice versa. So it feels like it would be pretty hard to restructure some of that midseason unless they're already planning like, hey, we're not just going to be expecting both of these guys to play the exact same system. And when one of them is at solo five, we're going to be more proactive than what Nate Bjorkman was. And we're not going to be so on autopilot with what our defensive system is in general that they could make the adjustment, but they, yeah. they aren't, they don't typically make, I mean, with the aside from Victor and what became necessary because they needed him to come back and kind of recoup his value it seems for the most part that their preference is to make those types of trades in the off season. I think in this case, because they have another new coach, they're kind of willing to see. And especially since this group of five has never played a minute of basketball together, yeah. they're willing to see what, you know, who fits with who and how does this, how does this new system sit on everybody before they make a big change, which I mean, makes sense in, in a certain regard, but. Yeah. For, and imagine making that decision before even seeing TJ Warren with yeah. like all this. And I think I would probably default to Jeremy Lamb just because I, I don't know, like, would they bring him back? And TJ Warren's injury just makes it so iffy. Um, yeah. but I, I even think with that, you're probably still want to see where the TJ Warren stuff would lead over Lamb. And if he's going to shoot like 40% from three again, maybe you keep him, but maybe that also makes him easier to move. So um, I do not know. But what do you, so when you look at this roster, whether it's a specific player archetype position or just a functional void, what is Indiana's biggest weakness on paper? Yeah, I mean, not that we need another defense rant, but they really got to find a scheme that fits for them defensively. That's not what they were doing last year. Like, I'm not anti-zone. I'm opposed to zone when you're running like seven different defenses and it looks pretty clear that guys don't know their roles and responsibilities and you're just running it against every opponent without a lot of thought about why exactly you're doing it other than to create chaos that ends up being confusion for yourselves some of the autopilot ball pressure, like just some systematically that's where I land. But I think from like a personnel standpoint, and I don't want to sound like I'm slam magazine or whatever, but like having a guy in the playoffs, that's like a legitimate one-on-one -on -one score who, you know, when your plays are scouted for when there's exaggerated coverage can still score and get points for you. And maybe Karis Levert comes to grow into that role. I mean, he wasn't, he had good moments in that playoff series in the bubble against the Raptors. Maybe he continues to grow into that the more he has the ball in his hands. But his numbers, it's interesting because aesthetically his game in one-on-one -on -one situations is more appealing to watch, I think, than Brogdon's. But Brogdon, for their careers, has been more efficient in isolation than Karras has been. And that's in part because he shoots threes and is better at shooting threes. But the point still stands, when, when Karras came over at the back end of the season, he struggled a little bit against attacking switches. And his shot profile kind of makes it difficult consistently for him to be a number one option, though he kind of needs to be a number one option for some of the reasons we laid out before. So for him, I think he needs to make a bit of a jump that can show like, hey, I can consistently be this kind of like what he was in May, which I mean, some of those numbers were juiced because the place the Pacers were just playing so ridiculously fast. But he did show growth in the two man game with he and Sabonis. So I do think that they need somebody that's like, hey, this is a wing scorer that we have that can go get points when stuff breaks. And, you know, that's somewhat TJ Warren, but not completely because you're not going to run a ton of stuff with him as initiator or on ball. And then when he does get exaggerated co coverages, he's not really a playmaker in the same way that Karras is. So if anybody's going to step into that role, that's kind of who it needs to be. This question, it's probably in for the Pacers more so than a lot of teams, is going to be matchup dependent. But what what should be their go to closing lineup in crunch time? Right. So for what the reasons I said before, it would be kind of annoying if Turner and Sabonis aren't both in that lineup because I just think your best players need to be able to close games for you. But mm. um, a lot of times over the last two years, it, it's involved Justin. I looked up when I, you sent me these questions. I was like, I wonder exactly how many clutch minutes Justin has played. And they played 168 
clutch minutes last year and Justin played 141 of them. So like as a bench player, and he was starting games last year when TJ was out as well, but like he's played 302 out of the 320 clutch minutes over the last two seasons. So they, they, they're obviously confident, both coaches, both Nates were confident in his ability, not only to provide value as a defender, but also be able to shoot the ball. So you want guys out there with two-way ability. So if you are going to downsize and you're going to pick either Turner or Sabonis in those situations, I think you look at if TJ's healthy, TJ, and then two from the Justin, Duarte, Craig grouping with, you know, hopefully you're hoping Duarte and Justin can, can handle that because what I said, like they're going to offer you scoring as well as defense. Is there a, and I was going through this cause it's, a, it's my favorite question to ask and think about, but this team's not really set up to be weird, but if there was, if you were that, if you're Rick Carlisle, is there a quirky unconventional lineup that you're just, just trying rolling out to see what happens? I want you to take this answer extremely seriously. I think that they, they need to roll out O'Shea Brissett, Isaiah Jackson, Goga, Turner, and Sabonis. They drafted all these, <laughs> these centers and signed them all. Time to play the all-center lineup. No, like I think that the Pacers for the last several years have never really had a lineup where they can say, like, this is a switch everything lineup. Like they they've never really had that option. So I don't I think it kind of sounds like they expect Isaiah Jackson to be playing with the Mad Ants more, but he can definitely challenge shots on the perimeter. So kind of selfishly. I'd like to see what happens if you play like Brogdon, Justin, Torrey Craig, O'Shea Brissett as like that sideline to sideline, uh, weak side rim protector guy with Isaiah Jackson at the five and his ability to kind of switch out. So I'd like to see a very switchy lineup just in, in very small minutes to see if they can do it because that's not something as a blogger I've really ever had the chance to cover. As you know, I'm a sucker for small ball lineups, and they will never try this lineup because, as you mentioned, they have roughly 80 centers on their 80 bigs on their roster. Give me TJ Warren, Tory Craig, Justin Holiday, Karis LeVert, and Malcolm Brogdon. I just want to see it for a few possessions, just to see what happens. Um, I don't. Warren's probably your de facto five in that situation. That probably ends terribly. But who knows? I also just want to see it. Um, well, they did some of that with O'Shea at de facto five when all the centers were injured. Like Karis and Brogdon, I mean, obviously TJ wasn't playing, but Karis and Brogdon and Justin and Doug would be out there with O'Shea Brissett at times or the back end of last season. So I'm just, I'm rooting for them to, for, I'm not rooting for injuries. I'm just going to root for them to trade some big so that they can open and TJ Warren to get healthy so that they can play my, my quirky lineup that I think would probably give Rick Carlisle heart palpitations, just looking at it on paper. Um, so there, as we're, we're recording this, their over under is set at 42.5. Would you take, the over the under on that and where in the larger scheme of the Eastern conference, do you um, see them finishing? And we talk about loaded questions. That is so difficult to ask without even having a timetable for TJ Warren. Right. I mean, I think that even with all their injuries last year, that they were on pace to win 38 games and an 82 schedule. And there's games like they were so bad in the fourth quarter at times, like they just ran out of gas and had inexplicable errors. Like if you look at their plus minus in the clutch at those clutch time minutes, like most of those guys were like minus 60 and the, and the clutch minutes they played. So like if some of that falls better in their favor, I think I don't feel bad about taking the over even with, you know, TJ being out early. I, I think that's possible, even though the East seems like it's improved for me. Like when I thought TJ was going to be available, I don't think it's ridiculous to think this team could be a six seed. Like now I do think that their range could be back at the bottom of the play in tournament. Like if you told me they were sixth and you told me they were 10th, I would think both of those outcomes were completely reasonable, but I think that they can be back and be a playoff team. I think that there's going to be a significant upgrade, not only just from some of the schemes Bjorkman is running, but from some of the stuff that was happening behind the scenes, like just an addition by subtraction there. Like I'm not somebody that thinks coaching is be all and end all in the NBA. I think talent matters more. But I think that last year was a very bizarre season for the Pacers, and I know that can apply to a lot of teams, but I think they're better than what the product they were putting out was in this yeah, I mean, past season. You look at the roster now, even without TJ Warren healthy or having Edmund Sumner, like they still just have a bunch of good players, and not everything's a perfect fit if we're still trying to talk about the Sabonis, Turner, what's going to happen with that. But if they're healthier, how do you not? This feels like a very easy over for me. I am, however, looking at, all the other podcasts, these look aheads that I've done, I'm apparently very optimistic about a lot of teams this year. I <laughs> smashed so many overs. I'm going to need to start going under. I only have under for the Warriors and the Thunder so far, but I'm just looking at this and it's like, unless 
they get hit with injury catastrophe again. I'm even baking in, like if TJ Moore doesn't return till Christmas, right. I'll probably still take the over here. And you think you mentioned about the East. I somehow feel like it's not getting talked enough as everyone's trying to figure out who's that third best team behind Milwaukee and Brooklyn. Those are very clearly the top two. There is, I think you could throw Atlanta, Miami into that discussion. If you want to say they're a cut above everybody else, but there's a chance that like three through nine or 10 could be depending on how you feel about the bulls, the Raptors, they could be like super interchangeable in the East where it's like the Pacers might not be a bad team, but could still finish 11th or something, but I could also see them finishing like four. (laughs) Yeah. Like it definitely feels like there's a mosh pit there of like Eastern conference teams competing for the sixth spot. (laughs) Is there anything or anyone I didn't ask you about that you think needs to be covered about this team? Did you need to dig deeper into the all center lineup that you want to see Rick Carlisle throw out? <laughs> no, never forget that Malcolm Brogdon even played a few minutes at center last year. That, that's how hard up the Pacers were. Um, I don't know that I could forget that because I'm not sure that I knew that. Yeah, that I'm trying to think happened. which, yeah, it actually happened. I'm trying to think which game that was because I took a screenshot of it and said, never forget. Oh, it was against the Spurs because more and more people were even getting hurt during that game and they were already out of centers to play. So it was in the fourth quarter. He played a couple minutes at center. I'm going to need to go back and watch that because that's it. Make it happen. I want to see it again then for an extended run. Uh, Caitlin, this was fantastic as always. Thank you for giving me so much of your time as per usual. You're able to tell our listeners where they can find you on social media and your work. Yeah. So my handle is at C2 underscore Cooper. And then my regular home is at Indy Cornrows where I have about one or two pieces per week, generally during the regular season, though I really haven't had something this week because I had a freelance piece over at 538. So Yes. Throw the confetti. That was a great piece. It was about Eric Gordon and the importance of just spacing. And man, who are we talking about in reference on this podcast? Uh, was it Turner? Oh yeah. Look, it's the it's Eric Gordon effect. He just needs to hoist them and be an actual threat. And we don't have to care as much about the percentages. You got a lot into what that can do just by taking, by virtue of taking those shots, at least I don't know if he's going to spot up from Eric Gordon range would be pretty interesting, but that was a great piece on 538. So check it out. Caitlin, thank you as always. You know by now, because I think this might be a double-digit appearance for you on Harwood Knox. I'll be pestering you again in the future. So thanks once more. Thanks for having me. Sign up for WinBet Sportsbook at wynnbet.com today using promo code BLUEWIRE to get up to $1,000 toward a risk-free sports bet. Offer subject to change, terms, and conditions at winbet.com. Must be 21 or older and present in the state where play-through winbet is available. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem, call 1-800-522-4700.